The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. It's one of the biggest decisions a person can make, to have kids or not. Add a pandemic to the mix and a tough call for some only gets tougher. Tonight, what that's doing to Canada's birth rate and possibly the country's future. Then, how well does Ontario's COVID-19 plan take the needs of disabled people into account? We'll find out. It's Thursday, February 3rd, and that's ahead on the agenda. There was a time way back at the beginning of this pandemic when people joked about the baby boom that would result from people having to stay home during lockdowns. Two years on, the facts on the ground could be more serious for Canada's future population. With us now for a closer look, in Vancouver, British Columbia, Marina Adshade, economist at the University of British Columbia. In Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Laura Wright, a family demographer and associate professor of sociology at the University of Saskatchewan. In the nation's capital, John Ibbotson, writer at large for the Globe and Mail and co-author of Empty Planet, The Shock of Global Population Decline. And here in the provincial capital, Dr. Tally Bogler, chair of family medicine obstetrics at St. Michael's Hospital and co-founder of the Pandemic Pregnancy Guide. And we're delighted to welcome all four of you to our program tonight. And we want to start, because we love charts on this show, we want to start by showing some charts. And I'll describe these in a little bit of detail for those listening on podcast who can't see them. This first one is Canada's annual fertility rate. And you don't have to be a genius to see that that's a line that goes up and starts to peak in the 19, just before 1960. And then after that, decline, decline, decline. And in the year 2020, we saw the fertility rate reach an all-time low, 1.4 children per woman. And of course, to maintain population status quo, you need 2.1, something that Canada hasn't hit since 1971. Let's do another chart. Canada's annual births. And once again, from 2019 to 2020, when COVID hit, there was a 3.6% drop in births. You see at the right-hand side of that chart, the line starts to head right down. And that is the greatest decrease and the lowest number of births in Canada in almost 15 years. Let's bring up some StatsCan numbers here. Almost 20% of Canadians aged 15 to 49 say they now want fewer children than they initially planned to have or that they'll have a baby later because of COVID. Ontario had the highest percentage of people changing their minds of any jurisdiction in the country. A quarter of visible minorities changed their plans. Meanwhile, more than 30% of 25 to 34 year olds say they've postponed pregnancy or will have fewer children. Only 4% said the pandemic made them want to have more children or to have a baby sooner. And StatsCan says Canada is now at risk of becoming what they call a lowest low fertility country, which means rapid population aging and stress on the labor market, health care and pension systems. Okay, let's get into this. Laura, we were assured that we were going to have a baby boom with everybody stuck at home. Hasn't happened. How come? You know, if you asked any demographer whether there would have been a baby boom or a baby bust, every single one of us would have said absolutely a baby bust. We know this is what happens in times of economic insecurity. This is what happened in the 1918 flu, even um, around the 2008 recession. We know that people tend to delay or, or forego children in, in these sort of uncertain times. Um, if you don't mind, there's two sort of things I would add to that data, just sort of caveat. Yes, please. Um, if you count nine months from the first lockdowns that's only december 2020 so this is like the tip of the iceberg we're not going to be really seeing the effect of this decline in fertility until we get the 2021 um data and also a tiny little uh point that manitoba has had delays in in their birth processing so the manitoba birth numbers aren't aren't reflected in that graph so it should be a little bit higher right now Gotcha. Okay. Marina, uh, let me just in my setup to your question say, I think I remember 50 years ago, they had a big power blackout in New York City and the power went out everywhere. And there was a baby boom that resulted in that, right? Everybody had to hunker down at home. Why hasn't that happened this time? 
Well, I mean, first of all, I think that was a little bit of a myth. And it it was a couple of days at home. It wasn't months and months and even years at home. Um, But this is a very different situation. I mean, first of all, there's the economic uncertainty. It's not a particularly good time to have children if you think you're going to lose your job. Um, But there's also the fact that um, with schools closing, with daycares closing, uh, for, for people who already have children, there was a lot of burden placed on those families, and, and particularly for, for women who are working outside of the home and, and are having a hard time balancing working and uh, taking care of their children. And so it's not an ideal time to add a new member of your family. So I got suckered into that myth about uh, the power of blackout in New York City, did I? Okay. I think people at the beginning, I think people loved the idea that we'd have all these babies come out of this. I think it was just optimism, but yeah. it, was, it wasn't it was well-placed. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, Tally Bogler, come on in here and tell us uh, about what you're hearing from your patients that you deal with in terms of decisions to postpone or maybe even not have kids at all. Yeah. So similar to what Marina just mentioned, um, from a study that I conducted and through interacting with many of my patients and our large community of followers on Pandemic Pregnancy Guide, which has over 43,000 followers of reproductive age women in Canada, there are very there are three common themes that consistently present themselves. And the first thing, as Marina just mentioned, is uncertainty. So economic uncertainty, including job loss, uncertainty about the future. There's also uncertainty and particularly fear about COVID-19 infection itself on the pregnancy and fetus. And this was certainly apparent in the first wave when so much was still unknown. Um, I was constantly getting asked, you know, should I delay getting pregnant right now? But then again, as we came to learn that the pregnant population is a high risk group for more severe COVID-19 illness and adverse pregnancy outcomes. And we saw this fear really peak in the third wave here in Ontario when we saw rising hospitalization rates of pregnant individuals. The fear has kind of settled a little bit with availability of vaccines, but rose again with various waves, especially with the Omicron variant. So that's number one, uncertainty. The second theme that keeps on coming up is disruption to the healthcare system and social supports. So in terms of the healthcare system, we know people have avoided all sorts of care during the pandemic for fear of COVID-19 infection or that, you know, worries that the system is overwhelmed. Um, people are aware that pregnancy and many of the ancillary services to support a pregnancy journey have been disrupted, whether it's prenatal classes, breastfeeding supports, or hospital policies restricting partners or support people while in labor. And I have to mention that fertility clinics were closed and still have backlogs, which certainly probably delayed things for many people. There's also been disruptions to wider social supports. So this notion that it takes a village to raise a child, well, that village for many people has been disrupted, either not allowing family members or extra supports into the home because of fear of COVID-19 infection or the closure of schools, which Marina mentioned has impacted supports for older children. There's just this wider sense of social isolation and people, you know, thinking about whether whether or not they want to bring a child into this time and not being able to celebrate with loved ones or receive that support from loved ones. And the last thing that I just want to mention, which is super important, is just the impact on mental health of young people, particularly women in reproductive age groups and those with children less than 15, have reported some of the highest levels of distress. So the isolation, school closures, mental load on women who bear overwhelmingly the job of caring for children. There's a reason we see headlines lines that show, you know, parents are not okay. New moms are not okay. Parents are breaking. And lastly, you know, a study that I conducted in the pregnant population found that almost 70% of pregnant individuals were reporting moderate to high levels of distress. So individuals that perhaps had a pregnancy in 2020, given their experience and the disruptions and high levels of distress, might actually be more reluctant to have an additional child in 2021 or 2022. Bottom line, I think, you know, the COVID-19 has pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic has reshaped our entire social landscape, including our intimate lives. And it's it's a hard decision right now for people to have children. Okay, we have the whys now. I want to go 30,000 feet up in the sky to bring in uh, John Ibbotson and talk about, I wonder, John, if you can situate Canada in the world. Is this a unique thing we're going through? No, it's not unique at all. And it is part of all of the things that the panelists uh, mentioned, and also a much longer term trend. 
uh, fertility rates um, have been declining in the developed, what we call today the developed world, in North America and Europe, since the, both the early 1800s. Um, there was a blip after the Second World War, uh, the baby boom, and as a result of births that were deferred because of war and because of depression. But generally speaking, um, the, the fertility rates have been going down now for a very long time. Um, and in the developing world, Daryl Bricker and I discovered uh, when we researched Empty Planet, they are crashing in a generation. They are doing their, uh, in 25, 30 years, what it took a century and a half for the developed world to, to achieve. And in the main, this is very good news. It is the result, for lowered fertility is the result of women having greater control over their lives, greater controls over their bodies, and deciding how many children they choose to have. And they invariably choose to have fewer than they have if they don't have that control. This is a universal phenomenon from Portland to Papua New Guinea. It is the same everywhere. And the speed with which women in developing countries are taking control and are making decisions is breathtaking. India has dropped below replacement rate. Indonesia just announced, uh, I believe last week, that it has reached replacement rate. China is going to start losing population in the next year or two. And here in Canada, as you say, um, the uh, um, fertility rate dropped below 2.1 in the 1920s. It's down to 1.4. Um, and even communities that were thought to have high fertility are seeing fertility going down. Uh, the indigenous population, for example, is now at replacement rate. It wouldn't surprise me at all if the next census showed that indigenous Canadians are now below replacement rate. That is great news because it means indigenous women have the means and the ability and are making the choices to have fewer children because they have greater control over their lives. One other, uh, just very quick uh, bit of historical context, we saw this happen a decade ago. The millennial fertility rate dropped during the Great Recession over the same thing, economic concerns. And the assumption was, well, they'll have babies later on once the recession ends. They didn't. Um, in all of these cases, a baby deferred is usually not a baby born later. It's just a baby not born. Hmm. Laura, I gather one of the reasons that people are concerned about this is because of something called the dependency ratio. Can you explain what that is to us? Sure. I mean, in really simple terms, the dependency ratio is just who's paying into the system, who's paying into the tax base, um, and who's drawing from the tax base in terms of, you know, healthcare costs or education costs. And when we have sort of uh, low birth rates and um, sort of low population growth due to, you know, immigration, um, which I'm sure we'll get into soon, that means we have fewer younger people and sort of the, the working age to contribute to, to the tax base, to contribute to pensions, and more people pulling um, resources from those pension systems. So a, a low birth rate, if, it, if it's not um, sort of uh, balanced uh, with, with different aspects of, of populate, population increase will mean population aging and more people drawing from the system than putting into it. Well, John, let me just pull you back in here quickly then, because I think the numbers are by the end of the decade, nearly a quarter of the population in this country are going to be senior citizens. And I wonder if you could just amplify on what Laura just said in terms of what does that mean for pensions? What does that mean for health care? What does that mean for the labor market, et cetera? It means fewer taxpayers uh, available to contribute to support pensions and health care for a, a larger number of seniors. Um, by 2030, the entire baby boomer generation will be over 65, and they will continue to make greater and greater demands on the system, and there will be fewer and fewer young people uh, coming into the workforce to pay the taxes uh, needed to support those older people. Also, younger people consume. They buy the first house, they buy the car, they buy the baby stroller, they, they buy the smart black dress for the office party. Um, if there are fewer of them, there are fewer consumers to drive economic growth. And that also has an impact. And I also know and hope that, of course, we will get into the, to, to the solution to that, to the extent that it's possible, immigration. The more you bring in immigrants to replace babies not born, the more you're able to offset the impact of an aging society. We are indeed going to get to that. But I want to ask Marina first whether, in your judgment, part of the solution to this problem is just all of us having more kids. Yeah, so I mean, this is the this is the issue. We always talk about the aging population when we talk about declining fertility rates, but the ability to use fertility to solve the aging population problem that ship sailed a long time ago. You know, Laura mentioned the dependency ratio. Of course, any child that's born today 
only increases the dependency ratio. For their first 20 years over their life, they draw on the system, healthcare, daycare, um, education, and that child won't be contributing taxes until probably 25 years from now, 30 years from now. And by that time, these boomers, um, you know, people born at the peak of the baby boom are already going to be in their 90s, and there's not going to be that many of them left. Um, the next generation that's coming, which is my generation, is much, much smaller. Um, so we're not going to be able to, to use births to s resolve this as an issue now. There has to be other solutions. Well, I got a chart. We always have a chart for something on this program. Go ahead, Sheldon. Let's bring up the chart. Top of page five, Canada's population growth as measured in annual population growth, net international migration, and natural increase. And if you go to the bottom, again, for those listening on podcast, there is a, pretty much a straight line right across the bottom of this graph in terms of natural increase, and it is actually heading down a little bit. And even the other two lines, which measure annual population growth and net international migration, those lines are going straight down as well, which does raise the question, okay, let's get to it. Laura, immigration, is that the ultimate solution? Ultimately, um, I would echo, you know, what Marina said, um, looking to increase the fertility rate um, is ineffective for a lot of reasons. Um, we know that baby bonuses don't work. There are some policies that we can implement to sort of make parenting and work-life balance easier, affordable childcare, flexible, you know, work and home life. But you're right, adding more children is not going to fix things in, in the short term. So immigration is, is really um, the key, um, bringing in those young, skilled immigrants. Um, 85% of Canada's population growth is due to immigration and not due to um, births. Um, and so we've, we've seen that absolutely drop. Like that, that line on that graph that is just a precipitous drop is showing, you know, all of this interrupted immigration, the border closing. Um, I think we, we lost the largest um, net loss of non-permanent residents in 2020 um, since 1972. Um, borders were closed, you know, international students were, were, were not invited in. Uh, the good news is, though, um, that close to 123,000 landed immigrants were welcomed into Canada between July and September 2021, which is the highest quarterly um, intake since 1946. So this, this does seem to be a little bit a, a blip, and hopefully we can, we can continue that, that trend. Yeah, John, as I set up my next question to you, I mean, here's here's a few facts. We've got the lowest population growth rate since 1916. We've got life expectancy in Canada decreasing by the largest amount since 1921. Thank you, COVID. Births are down. Migration, lowest levels in more than two decades. Uh, what chances do we have to improve immigration to the extent that that's a solution for us when we're living under COVID? Well, uh, the odds are actually pretty good. We had uh, the highest intake of permanent residents last year that we have ever had in this country's history. Um, and we did it by essentially taking um, temporary workers and, tempor and, and foreign students in Canada and converting them to permanent residents. So that's the temporary fix. But the borders are opening up this year and next and the year after that. Uh, we should be able to bring our intake up to about 1% of the population or better. Um, that is about the most aggressive immigration intake on the planet. Um, and it is more aggressive than in the past because Australia and New Zealand, which often compete with Canada for immigrants, um, appear to be deciding that they're going to keep their borders mostly closed, that they that they rather like not bringing in so many newcomers anymore. Um, that's a, a, a terrible mistake for those countries. It's a terrible mistake for Britain. And to the extent the United States does it, it's a terrible mistake for the United States because all of these countries, like Canada, need immigrants in order to power economic growth and to replace lost babies. Now, this is still only a medium-term solution because, as I said, the developing world is crashing its fertility rate as well. Our biggest source intake is from India. India is now at fertility rate, uh, a replacement rate. Our second biggest source typically was China. China is actually losing population. Our third biggest source of immigrants is the Philippines. And the Philippines are starting to write stories and re issue reports about the plummeting fertility rate in Philippines. You're going to see a situation not too long, not too far down the road, where countries like Canada compete to find people who will be willing to leave their country and come uh, to a place like ours. Luckily, as I said, 
we have a better shot at getting them than any other country on earth, and that's Canada's competitive advantage. Okay. Having said that, I want to ask uh, Tally uh, Bogler whether or not she thinks governments in this country ought to be, and you can fill in the blank here, I don't know, aggressively encouraging, bribing, uh, do, doing whatever it takes to get women in this country to have more kids. What do you think? I mean, I think as was mentioned, bribing or, you know, bonuses um, throughout history have shown that it hasn't really worked. But I think the th what stands out to me right now is affordable child care. And I know many of the provinces are in negotiations with the federal government. But if we want to, quote unquote, incentivize parents to have more kids, we need to make it feasible and we need to provide the adequate supports for them to raise children in this world. Um, so, you know, affordable housing and affordable child care is incredibly important for individuals to decide that they can feasibly have children in this world. Marina, is there any reason to believe that if, I think Ontario is the only holdout in the whole country right now, every other jurisdiction has a child care agreement with the federal government, is there any reason to believe that if every jurisdiction in the country, including Ontario, had child care agreements with the federal government, that would be seen as an encouraging sign for women to have more kids? I mean, I think that it's possible. Like, I agree with everybody that neonatal policies in general don't work. Um, I think the only thing that has any hope is is affordable daycare. And and you know, if we really consider declining fertility as a budget problem, if we're concerned about the aging population or the loss of taxpayers, one of the good things about affordable childcare is it encourages people to be in the workplace. I mean, it's a policy that has the uh, possibility of maybe increasing fertility, but also creating more workers. And, and really, if creating more workers is what we need, then we need policies that get people into the workplace and keep them into the workplace, and, and particularly when they get a little bit older. Uh, all those bamer, boomers who are retiring, it'd be great for everybody if they could stay in the workforce um, until like 65 or even 70 to alleviate part of these problems. Well, By the way, we should mention, if we can, just very briefly, there is one possible exception to all of this, and that is Hungary. Hungary is, uh, the Hungarian government right now is profoundly xenophobic. It does not want immigrants coming into that country. It wants to keep Hungary for the Hungarians. And it is encouraging women to have babies. Uh, extraordinarily generous bonuses for women who have babies. Essentially, if you agree to have four kids, the state will take care of your income. But it's offensive, morally offensive, because it's really not encouraging women to have babies and work. It's encouraging women to have babies and stay home. It is encouraging a return to uh, a highly unenlightened past, just one of the many unenlightened policies of the Orban government. I'm glad but you clarified that. I, we, we will have to watch and see if, in fact, it works. I'm we glad you study. clarified that, John, because I, I, I would hate to think that the Globe and Mail's best columnist is advocating <laughs> illiberal democracy for Canada as a way to get towards women <laughs> having more babies. <laughs> Absolutely not, but we do have to watch what happens. Okay, Laura, I see you want to get in. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I think one thing that we sort of haven't talked about um, in terms of how we could potentially increase the fertility rate is addressing, you know, we, we've been skirting around it that, that parenting is hard and parenting in a pandemic is especially hard. And I think what we've seen is that the, you know, the requirement of unpaid labor has just increased with, with homeschooling and trying to balance work, work and home. And this hasn't increased equally for men and women. We know that um, moms and, and women have taken on much more of this sort of unpaid labor burden. And we know that when women are are unhappy or, or, or think that the gender division of labor at home is unfair, they are much more they're much less likely to want to have more children. So they're going to be decreasing their their fertility there. So that the pandemic has probably increased this, which means in, in terms of policy, we need to fix the un we need to fix the gender division of, of labor. And how do you do this with policy is, you know, it's not a simple fix. Um, affordable childcare will help, I think, um, keeping, you know, giving women um, and mothers uh, the chance to work for, for paid employment. Uh, we've also seen some evidence that paternity leave, not just mm -hmm. maternity leave, but sort of take it or lose it, uh, paternity leave that, um, was in Quebec for a long time and is in, is in the new uh, iteration of uh, the federal EI policy, encourages men to take paternity leave and changes the culture of expectations of, of, of 
fatherhood and of men as employees. When you know, uh, when a man, a young man, and a young woman go to apply for a job, if if it's expected and normal that young men will be taking that paternity leave, uh, just like a like the young woman would be, then we have less sort of gender distinctions there. Um, and then we know if you know if. Uh, fathers take paternity leave. It's good for fathers. It's good for children. It's good for marriages. It's good for unions. It, it makes things much more stable. Marina, could you talk about whether or not, I don't know what you want to call it. Is there a lost generation of babies not being born right now? Is that how you'd phrase it? Well, I mean, first of all, I mean, anybody who thinks they can predict what happens next, I think, is is going out on a limb. I mean, we don't know. Uh, John mentioned that the babies that were lost in the in the financial crisis, which was relatively brief, um, didn't appear later. Um, but there is one group of people who probably will have as many children, and that's women who um, avoided getting pregnant as teenagers. You know, during the lockdown because we weren't going to school, there were no prom pregnancies. Um, and so the teen births that we lost will probably be recouped later on when those women are older and, and are choosing the timing of their own births. So I think that it's going to be it's going to be a real challenge um, to see how many of those births are recouped. And then, of course, um, we've already heard that fertility treatments were delayed. I mean, some of those women who might have otherwise had children on the other end of the age distribution will have aged out of having children completely by the time um, this is all resolved. So it's it's hard to tell where it's going to land. Um, I can't imagine we're staying at 1.4 births. Um, and I, I think we're, we're possibly going to recoup a little bit, but we'll probably never make up all the births that we've lost. I'm wondering, Laura, what this if does to... Yeah, you want to... Sure, you want to add to that, please. Yeah, sorry. Just a, another thing that, that has been interrupted that we haven't talked about is dating and marriage trajectories. The number of marriages that have, have been delayed, um, it's, it's, I don't have the numbers, but I, I assume is, I, I know it's very high. Um, not just marriages, but We've had two years of sort of lockdowns and limited, you know, meeting of people and, and, and mobility where we haven't had unions form. We haven't had people starting dating relationships and then progressing to cohabiting and then potentially getting married or not, which means we have two year, a potential two year lag in even like the, the formation of these relationship trajectories, which might mean that this decline in fertility that we're, we're seeing, you know, just starting in December 2020 will, will continue for at least the next couple of years. Okay. Um, and as, you know, John rightly pointed out, married at, sorry, babies delayed are often babies foregone. Um, the later you start having children, the, typically the fewer children that you have, you just run out of childbearing years. Well, let's, Tally, let's indulge in some yeah. um, informed speculation here. Let's call it that. I mean, at the end of the Spanish flu 100 years ago, uh, we did get the Roaring Twenties. And there was a great boom at that point when people, you know, were celebrating the fact that they were among the living again. And I, I wonder whether or not you might anticipate uh, the same kind of reaction once we get to the point where we're not having to cower under COVID anymore. Yeah. I just want to add just one more thing to what Laura said in terms of marriages. Um, you know, the other thing that has happened during this pandemic is relationships have taken a toll. I don't know if we have stats yet on divorce rates, but we know that sexual desire and sexual activity have actually decreased during the pandemic, and that's from Canadian studies. Um, and this is even as restrictions eased. You know, couples spending more time together 24-7 might not have benefited from that phenomenon of distance makes the heart grow fonder, hmm. right? So that will be interesting to see as well. I think in general, you know, only time will tell to see if this reproductive generation impacted by the pandemic will have, you know, the same number of children, but later on, or their ideal number of children will have changed because of these circumstances. I think it's very important to point out, and we haven't mentioned, that Canada is a late childbearing country to begin with, right? So the average age of mothers at time of delivery is 31. So a delay of one to two years might not be a big deal, but Further, more than that, you know, people might not be achieving their desired family size just due to the biological limits to childbearing. I do just want to your question specifically. I think what I've heard is many people are at the point where their attitudes are like, I'm not going to let COVID dictate my lives anymore in the sense that they're no longer going to put major life decisions on hold. And you're, we're getting that sense a little bit more. And I'm hearing that from my patients and from our community online. Um, and so, you know, they waited, they put things on hold for the first year, 
for the second year, they were waiting to see if there's more certainty in the world. But now they're like, I need to have that child. I can't wait any longer. So I think we're getting that feeling a little bit more now as well. Hmm. John, if you multiply that by, I don't know, one million or two million different families across the country, is it possible we could have a baby boom when COVID finally becomes endemic? Well, there might be a little boonlet, but I think the long-term trend is in the other direction. Um, I know that StatsCan has decided that we are among the lowest of the low in terms of fertility countries. No, they ain't seen nothing yet. Uh, South Korea has dropped below one. Uh, countries like Japan and Taiwan and Singapore, they are all crashing down to one or below one uh, or very close to one, a uh, one full baby short of replacement rate. Um, and they are going to lose substantial portions of their population over the course of this century. China will lose up to half of its population over the course of this century. The same phenomenon is underway in parts of Eastern Europe as well. It is reasonable to assume that Canada will mimic everyone else and that our population will continue, uh, our total fertility rate will continue to decline to somewhere around one. No one yet has actually seen what the absolute bottom of, of this trajectory is. And it does start to get scary, and it does place an even greater emphasis on the need to keep our borders open and immigrants coming in as, uh, as many as we can possibly absorb uh, every single year to try to compensate for that. John, as a guy who's been writing about this stuff for a long time, I wonder whether you ever find yourself, uh, you know, kind of shocked about the fact that when, well, when you and I were younger, we kept hearing the planet is going to explode because we're having way too many babies and it's a population bomb. That's what they called it. And now you're saying exactly the opposite. Does that kind of shock you? Well, it shocked Daryl and me enough that we wrote a book about it. I mean, that's what Empty Planet is about. We're projecting that the population of the planet, and there are a great many demographers now who are coming around to this, um, will not reach 11 billion, as the UN suggests. And our population is going to peak somewhere around 8 and 9 billion, somewhere in the middle of the century, and then it's going to start to go down and go down fast. This is a global phenomenon. And I suspect that, you know, uh, when uh, TBO uh, does its episode in 2080, uh, one of the things that we'll be talking about is the, is the crisis of global population decline. John, I can't wait uh, for you and I to be on that program. Uh, <laughs> promise me you'll be on it. If I'm hosting it, promise me you'll be on it. It's a deal. It's a deal. Great. Laura, how about this? Um, and I don't want to indulge in too many stereotypes here, but I will just for argument's sake a little bit. You know what they say about this generation of childbearing people, right? that um, they're all extremely individual and, um, you know, just very, very interested in what utterly unique people they are in the world. Has that kind of sense of individuality contributed to the fact that uh, they don't want to have as many kids as their parents or grandparents? Oh, I, I think that's a that's a big question. That's a loaded question. I think um, <laughs> sort of this we've seen this historical trend towards you know lower fertility. We call it like the demographic transition that is argued to be partly driven by this like push towards individualization, individual happiness, the the, the pursuit of, of of your freedoms and 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 what makes you happy versus sort of like those traditional ideas about you know supporting your family and sort of these responsibilities, these these you know religious or or familial responsibilities. So I don't think it's any specific generation that is, you know, particularly individualistic. I think the, the bigger issues are sort of the structural constraints that the, the, the childbearing population is dealing with right now. It's the unaffordable housing. It's, um, e you know, economic uncertainty, uh, you know, job losses, stagnant wages, inflation. It's its that, you know, children um, cost money, <laughs> cost <laughs> a lot of money. Um, and that, um, you know, it really does take a village to to raise children. Um, and I think sort of the, the other implications of this aging population is that, um, you know, you, you used to think about a family tree and you had like all of these, these branches coming off of your tree, but with fewer and fewer um, babies born per generation, our, our babies are, our families are looking much more like a bean pole. So we have many generations alive at, this, at, at a time, but few people within each of those generations, which means these sorts of, you know, family support systems, family care systems, grandparents taking care of grandkids or adult children taking care of their aging parents, there's there's fewer people to draw on. Mm. Um, so I don't think it's about 
selfishness about you know um, self-fulfilling and, and and some sort of you know pursuit of of happiness in a hedonistic sense I, I think it's trying to balance all of these really competing um, challenging structural systems um, that make having having babies and having large families really difficult gotcha well I did say I was indulging in stereotyping there just for effect <laughs> but anyway uh, down to our last couple of minutes here and Tally let me ask you about this most people I talk to who have children say it's the greatest thing they've ever done in their lives. It has brought such joy and, and yes, of course, heartbreak and difficulties and all that, but at the end of the day, it's the most meaningful thing they will ever do. Are you really telling us that there are patients of yours that, that say, you know, the price of housing is too big these days and therefore I'm going to forego that profound experience? Really? You know, what I'm hearing more is, in my practice at least, um, my patients who have had a child or two and maybe thought they would have three or maybe even four, after experiencing the hardship of the last two years, are saying to themselves, you know, I think we're good. Um, it's been really tough and their ideals and values have shifted. Um, and I think it's just really important to remember that Canada, and I just want to mention this, you know, similar to other Western countries, um, women develop their professional and educational paths often before entering motherhood and childbearing is postponed. And so the more it's postponed and, you know, this pandemic, which has just heightened so many of the challenges we have in terms of, um, you know, children and childbearing, um, it might have just postponed things a little bit more for people. And so either people have changed their values, they've changed their ideals, they've had a really difficult time in terms of disruption of their entire social networks um, and are saying, you know what, I'm, I might not have that additional child right now and that's okay for me. Understood. That was a fascinating discussion, you four. Thanks to Dr. Tally Bogler, John Ibbotson, Marina Adshade, and Laura Wright for coming onto the agenda tonight. Take care, everybody, and thanks again. Thanks, Steve. The past two years, of course, have been challenging as all get up for the general public of Ontario. But imagine how much more difficult it has been for people with disabilities. Getting access to vaccines, testing kits or elective surgeries. Given that more than 15 percent of Ontarians report having a disability of some kind, we're talking about more than two and a half million people who have had things particularly tough since COVID hit. Let's get you up to speed on some of the issues facing the disability community. Joining us from the provincial capital, in Midtown Toronto, there's David Lepofsky, Chair of the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act Alliance. David, it's always good to have you on our program. How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing good and great to be talking to you. Excellent. Let's just, uh, for those who don't know, um, maybe just give us 30 seconds off the top here on the mission of your alliance. What do you guys do? Our goal is to achieve a barrier-free, fully accessible province for people with any kind of disability, whether it's a physical disability, a mental health condition, a sensory disability, I'm a blind guy, uh, an example of that, a communication disability, any learning, any kind of disability. And we try to do it by getting the government to effectively implement the accessibility law we fought for for a decade and won in 2005, the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. The last time you were on this program, we were neck deep as a province in a very fulsome debate about triage protocols. In other words, let me just set this up. If resources are scarce and doctors have to make decisions about, well, we only have enough this, that or the other thing to treat one patient and I've got two here, what do I do? You were concerned that able-bodied people were going to be preferred over so-called disabled people. Where is the debate over those protocols right now? Well, the problem is a very serious one, and it's a real one. Let me tell you why. A year ago, in fact, the day I was last on your show, last year, a year ago, January, the government uh, uh, allowed a secret protocol to be sent to all hospitals that spells out the rules for who would be refused life-saving critical care if there are not enough critical care beds to go around, and I don't mean a mattress, I mean all the services, the doctors and so on. And that protocol, which was leaked to us, put posted on our website, but still never revealed by the government, it 
includes explicit disability discrimination. In other words, some patients with disabilities will get deprioritized if we ever needed to do that critical care rationing. A year later, Steve, that's now been embedded in the mindsets of all of Ontario's hospitals because their emergency and intensive care staffs have been trained on how to use it. So the message to them is, oh, this, this is okay to do. Now, one more thing. Thankfully, we've not hit the point where the hospitals have had to explicitly ration critical care, although we've gotten close. But what is going on right now is that elective surgery has been ration. We've had to slow it down. Some people are getting it. Some people aren't. We understand that that's the case, but we're deeply concerned that the disability discrimination that the Ford government is allowed to be mainstreamed in our hospitals for critical care is trickling down into decisions over elective surgery at the cost of potentially the health and lives of some people with disabilities. David, and let me do a quick follow up on this government with Let me do a quick follow up sure. on this because you say it's explicit in the legislation and and you know, here here's naive me pushing back saying, "Wait a second. I can't believe that there's an explicit reference in legislation from the government of Ontario that says, doctors when in doubt, make sure you give the preferred treatment to able-bodied people and discriminate against disabled people." Are you saying that's what's in there? Okay. Okay. First, it's not legislation. It's a memo to the hospitals telling them the rules, but it, it, it operationally tells them what to do. It doesn't say it in the words you've just said. In fact, it claims they're not supposed to do that, but it goes on to say that if you have, I'll give you two examples that are explicitly in there. Number one, if a patient's over 65 and has a degenerative conditions like Parkinson's or multiple sclerosis or others, they're Uh, priority or lack of priority is going to depend on an assessment of whether they can get out of bed on their own, feed themselves on their own, do their taxes on their own, shop on their own. In other words, it's a checklist which boils down to how much of a disability do they have. It also provides that if somebody needing critical care has cancer, uh, they are going to be less likely to be prioritized for getting critical care if there has to be rationing, if they're completely disabled and bedridden, for example. And uh, these, or, or on a sliding scale of which that is the most serious. So in other words, for that population, the extent of their disability becomes a measure or a criterion for whether they get critical care. And while the government's spokespeople or defenders say, oh, that's not disability discrimination, I got to tell you, as somebody, uh, a, a lawyer and a visiting law professor at the Osgoode Hall Law School, it is blatant, obvious textbook disability discrimination. Okay, understood. Let's bring another voice into this conversation as well. We want to welcome Wendy Porch, who is the executive director at the Center for Independent Living in Toronto, and she joins us from the capital city. And Wendy, I know that you have been keeping an eye on this issue of triage protocols as well. What's your understanding of where things are at as we speak tonight? We are in the same place we were last year in terms of the triage protocol. We we know that there is a triage protocol. Nobody's ever seen it. The government hasn't been transparent about it. They haven't asked us about it. And the people that I work with, uh, the consumers that I work with, people with disabilities, are terrified to go to hospital. They will avoid going to hospital at any expense at the moment because they do not want to end up in hospital and be triaged out of uh, life-saving treatment. So. That's what I know. I also know people with disabilities who have been to hospital in the pandemic because they couldn't avoid it. And they have uh, discharged themselves as soon as they could because they wanted to get out of hospital. Wendy, let me ask you this follow-up because we're sort of doing a a bit of a report card a year later since uh, you were last on the program as to how this pandemic's going for people uh, with disabilities. Uh, For example, getting test kits, getting access to vaccinations, uh, other aspects, access to elective surgeries, for example. Uh, How are things for disabled people in your world? Things are still very rough. I think, you know, we we have warned government and we've warned uh, health service providers that people with disabilities have been left out of planning. Uh, The emergency plans for the pandemic have never included our our population. They've never seen people with disabilities as a priority or as a group requiring extra supports because of the vulnerabilities. So 
if you're asking about test kits, uh, people who receive home care at the moment uh, have a really hard time getting test kits. If you're a person with a disability and you're looking to access uh, personal protective equipment, that is still an issue for people who are on fixed incomes, usually living at or below poverty. It's still very hard for them to find those things. So we, we feel as though we have been saying this for years now, that this is a group of people who really require uh, they require prioritization. We require prioritization. We require attention to be paid, and it's just not happening. David, let's really bring it down to earth here. If, if an able-bodied person wants to do something as simple as, let's say, getting their OHIP card renewed, which we all have to do, incidentally, by the end of February, uh, I guess most of us will go online. We will use our driver's license as a piece of identification to prove we are who we are. Um, I am guessing that as a visually impaired person, you don't have a driver's license. And as a result, I wonder how you will do it. Well, I've been forced to have to bring a court application against the Ford government because here again, as in so many instances in their response to the pandemic, they're discriminating against people with disabilities, contrary to our human rights code and contrary to the Charter of Rights. The, the starting point for renewing your health card is the only way you can do it online is if you have a driver's license. I'm blind. For that reason, I can't get a driver's license. So I am forced to have to go to a Service Ontario venue. Well, that exposes me to the risk, a health risk, uh, of getting uh, exposed to other people. And as a blind person navigating a Service Ontario venue, I can't be sure that I'm steering clear of other people so as not to get within the two meter range. Now, this is ridiculous enough as it is. But the government was warned over two years ago by the Canadian National Institute for the Blind that this was a disability discrimination barrier. They were warned last month by the Ontario Human Rights Commission, and they still are stumbling with fixing it, which is why last week I had to start a court application. One more thing to make this even more ridiculous. A decade ago, commendably, the government of Ontario created a new uh, photo identification card, an Ontario photo ID card, and I have one. It's meant to be equivalent as government photo ID uh, to a driver's license for people who can't get one, and that's what it is. But the government has not allowed us to use that to uh, uh, renew our health cards online. We've asked the government to extend the February 28th deadline for renewing uh, an expired health card while they fix this because they finally last week on the eve of me bringing this lawsuit, they finally said, oh, by May, we'll let you use your photo card uh, to renew your health card online. So I said, fine, why don't, why don't you extend that deadline uh, till uh, you get this thing fixed so that nobody is forced to go to uh, a service Ontario venue and risk their health to get their health care covered. And the initial answer I was told, I kid you not, and I seriously can't make this up, is that the government will direct doctors to accept a, an expired health card after February 28th, but they won't tell the public this. So your viewers are hearing it from me, <laughs> but the government won't tell them this. Okay, let me get Wendy into this. Wendy, do you have that, any that... other absurd examples from your uh, firsthand knowledge? Uh, this driver's license one sure seems like one. Yeah, so I think a great example of, of being left out of, you know, accessibility around healthcare at the moment relates to vaccines. So we know that vaccines are really the most powerful tool that we have against uh, COVID. And we know people with disabilities are more likely to get COVID and more likely to experience dire outcomes because of COVID. And I, I currently chair the Accessibility and COVID-19 Vaccines Task Force at the City of Toronto. And we've had some local success uh, with super supportive clinics that have accommodations available. We've had more than 2,500 people with disabilities in the city of Toronto receive vaccines with these additional supports. But the provincial booking site for, uh, for making a vaccine appointment is not accessible. And not only is it not accessible, it provides no opportunity for somebody with a disability to inquire about the accessibility of the vaccine clinic that they're trying to get to or to say what kinds of accommodations they might need. So that means somebody who is deaf and uses ASL 
cannot say when they're making their appointment that they need to have an ASL interpreter on hand for their appointment to happen. Hmm. That seems to me to be ridiculous, knowing all that we know about the vulnerability of our community and the protection afforded by vaccines. Okay, we've brought a number of examples Steve, forward here between David. So, sorry, stand by, David. I want to do one quick follow-up with Wendy here, sure. which is... Uh, we, we've done a number of examples here, triage protocols, access to test kits, access to vaccines, access to renewed driver's license, uh, excuse me, uh, renewed OHIP cards uh, by having to show a driver's license, which in the case of visually impaired people is a bit of a, an absurd ask. Okay, we have all this happening. I presume, Wendy, as the head of one of the more significant disability rights organizations in this province, you've had meetings with people in government to raise all these issues. What are you finding? I have found, I think many of us have found from the start of the pandemic that we are, we're just continuing to repeat ourselves with very little actual action. So, you know, we've seen significant uh, moves forward in terms of having, you know, representation from mental health groups at the provincial decision making tables and uh, representation from a range of stakeholders. But there is never any representation from the community of people with disabilities. So plans are made, decisions are made and things are implemented. And we don't even have a seat at the table to say this is not going to work for our community. Uh, there is no disability lens around any of the planning that's been coming out of, of any of the levels of government that I've worked with so far. We've had this great success with the City of Toronto, uh, who are really working very hard alongside Toronto Public Health in terms of our local vaccine work. But what happens in any of the other municipalities? I've never heard of any of this kind of work happening in another city. And it's because there's been a vacuum of leadership in terms of the province. David, do you want to do any naming and shaming here? Well, it boils down to this. People with disabilities, we warned from the outset of this pandemic, are disproportionately prone to get COVID, disproportionately prone to get its worst medical consequences, and disproportionately prone to die from it. After all, those who've most likely died, the biggest number of those who died are are people in long-term care, and those are people with disabilities. Now, we said to the government, the Ford government from the outset, you need to not do a one-size-fits-all emergency plan that assumes that everyone in Ontario has no disability, because millions of us do, and more are going to get them. And the Ford government has simply not followed our advice. Okay, I need to know what that means, though, David. Abysmal. Hang on. I need to know what that means, because there's no such thing as the right. Ford government. At the end of the day, you're talking about a person or a group of people or some deciders. Who are you running into who's a stumbling block? Well, I'll give you an example. Well, Premier Ford won't meet us at all. We've asked repeatedly. Uh, his health minister, uh, Christine Elliott, We've written to her 10 separate times over the critical care triage to offer help and make inquiries, never answered a single question. Uh, with respect to the concerns that we've raised about overall vaccine management, again, uh, no action. I guess that's coming from all of their COVID planning. Uh, and when I've, the only time I've had meetings, I got to tell you, in my leadership role over anything to do with COVID and health, it's uh, with the government, it's been over this uh, health card uh, uh, renewal issue. And we, we had good conversations, but it, with no results, leading me to have to uh, go to court against them, which is absurd. Wendy, who's the minister that you usually negotiate with when you want to have improvements for disabled people? It, it depends on the on the area that we're we're trying to improve. Of course, the Minister of Health is is uh, uh, the minister that oversees most of the kinds of things that we're talking about today. Okay, we, we got a, we got a we, few. Sorry, go ahead. You wanted to. You also wanted to say. I wanted to say, you know, one of the things that we've been hearing from from the provincial government uh, in uh, the Ministry of Health around this is that uh, you know they've made decisions around who priority groups are, who really needs attention in the pandemic based on evidence. And we have had very little evidence about the impact of the pandemic on disabled people because no one asks the question. So we're caught in a kind of a, a catch 22. We did have a very significant report published earlier this week in the Canadian Medical Association Journal. And they looked at the experiences of people with disabilities and people without disabilities who were admitted to hospital for COVID. And they found what we've been saying all along is true 
that disabled people have worse outcomes than people without disabilities. So we have this evidence in an Ontario-based uh, context. We know that people with disabilities will have longer hospital stays now, 36% longer. We know that people with disabilities are 77% more likely to be readmitted to the hospital uh, once they are actually discharged because we don't know why. No one's asked that question. But we have this evidence. Uh, so we, we need to see some real action. We don't just need to know more. We need to make better plans. We need to have a seat at the table. We need to be a part of making sure that our community is represented when we're thinking about these emergency plans. In which case, David, let's finish up on this. Uh, I note, I guess next month, will be the third anniversary of the release of former Lieutenant Governor David Onley's report, which was a kind of a, a report card uh, on the province of Ontario and offering some ideas as well to make life better for disabled people. In the intervening three years since that Onley report came out, what's happened? Well, in fact, it was released three, it was sent to the government uh, three years ago this past Monday. It provide, It found that as of then, Ontario is well behind its mandatory goal of becoming accessible by 2025. Uh, Mr. Onley, the former lieutenant governor, concluded that progress on accessibility was at a glacial pace, his words, and that Ontario remains a, soul, a, a province full of soul-crushing barriers facing people with disabilities. We've been calling on the government to implement that report's recommendations. And while the minister responsible for accessibility said that Mr. Onley did an, uh, a marvelous job, in the intervening three years, they have not announced a comprehensive plan to implement that report. And therefore, what we found is that progress on accessibility in Ontario over the past years has been glacial. But as illustrated by the topics we've covered in this interview, things in some key ways have gotten worse for people with disabilities uh, under the leadership of, of Premier Ford. Now, we're nonpartisan. I don't want to sound like uh, anything otherwise. We've been offering advice, and we were more than happy to work with them to solve these problems. But uh, the, the a table has to have two people at it if there's going to be a conversation. And sadly, uh, our table doesn't. Understood. David Lepofsky and Wendy Porch, we're grateful for your time tonight here on TVO. Take care, you two, okay? Thanks a lot and stay safe. And that is the agenda for Thursday, February 3rd, 2022. Tomorrow, Nam Kiwanuka checks in on the leadership struggles in the Federal Conservative Party this week. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org. And Nam, we'll see you here tomorrow. The agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. The agenda is always on. To catch up on conversations from this week or any week, visit our website, tvo.org slash the agenda, or our YouTube page at youtube.com slash the agenda. It's all there for whenever you want to watch.